I'm going to be in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is going to be about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest subject in the Bible. The most epic battle in the Bible. But growing up as a lost kid, the world would throw false gods in my face, in your face. The world and the devil will give you these fantasy heroes. When you get saved, you realize that the heroes you looked up to in the movies or in books or on you know, comic book characters some people get into... The superheroes are nothing but counterfeits of our Savior and future glorified bodies. Whether that be Superman, Batman, Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, all that. Joel chapter 2, it gives a great prophecy about the saints coming back with the Lord in glorified bodies. Coming back with the Lord at the second coming. And it is chalk full of details of that future event. You get a glimpse into the sounds, sights, the soldiers, and mindsets of the inhabitants who will be on the receiving end of the wrath of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, let's look at it. In Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, you're going to see... The senses at the second coming. The sounds. In Joel chapter 2, look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. Joel 2 1 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So the sounds, you hear a trumpet. An alarm, the land trembling. So you see the sounds. Look at verses 4 through 5. It says, The appearance of them is as the appearance of horsemen, and as horsemen so shall they run, like the noise. See how the Bible's painting a picture? You think it's just black words on white paper, but it's painting a picture right before your eyes with sounds, with sights. It says, Like the noise. Of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Can't you just hear that? Chariots and horses. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. Can't you just hear that flame burning? As a strong people set in battle, battle array. So you got a trumpet sounding. Look at verse 10 through 11. You heard an alarm. You heard chariots, horses. A flame, in verse 10 through 11, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens sh shall tremble. The Lord shall utter his voice, for his camp is very great. You see the sounds. This is the senses at the second coming. It gets going to get a hold of all their senses. He says, in verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and the day of the Lord cometh. This puts you in a second coming context when you see that phrase, the day of the Lord. Depending on what you did with Jesus Christ determines whether or not this is a sound of victory or a sound of terror. Are these sounds at the second coming? Are you going to be hearing them and it be a sound of victory or is it going to be a sound of terror? As a kid, I would freak out if I heard something loud outside because I thought it could possibly be the Lord coming back. And I had no idea about the rapture versus the revelation. I didn't know the, the any difference between the rapture and the second coming or nothing like that. But I remember the fright that went through my body when I heard loud sounds. Just a sound can strike fear in a person. I thought maybe Jesus Christ really, really was coming back. And there have been a series of unknown sounds around the world today even. People are freaking out over fake trumpet sounds. And something weird is going on with all that stuff. But imagine what they'll do when it is the real thing, when it is real trumpet sounds. No wonder Joel 2.1 says the inhabitants of the land tremble. 
Joel describes the noise of chariots and says it's like the noise of a flame of fire. Imagine the earth quaking and the Lord's voice in Joel 2.11 like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine as it talks about in Psalm 78.65 and like many waters or as a trumpet. His voice is described as sounding like many waters. It's described as sounding as a trumpet in Revelation chapter 4. Make sure these sounds of the Lord's voice will be to you sweet sounds of victory and not sounds of terror. But the second coming, it's going to get a hold of all your senses. You're going to hear sounds you never heard before. You're going to see sights you never heard. In Joel 2, 4, it says, The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. In Matthew 24, 30, it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Just because the Bible is black words on white paper doesn't mean it doesn't paint the picture. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. You're going to see it. You're going to look. You need to go ahead and look on him who was pierced on the cross for you now. Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Believe on him before you see him. And then when you see him, you'll be on the winning side and you'll be riding behind him on a white horse instead of getting squashed under his right white horse. That is, if you even make it that far. So, there's sounds. There's sights. There's smell. Imagine the smell of fire, as it talked about in Joel 2.5. Imagine the smell of blood and burning flesh. Smoke and fire will be going in a man's nostrils. The blood will be up to the horse's bridles. Revelation 14, 20. You see, man has loved blood. They have loved the slasher movies. Now they get to experience it with sound, sight, and even the smell. It says in verse 6 of Joel chapter 2, All faces shall gather blackness. It's like an atomic blast going off in their face because our God is a consuming fire. The word well, the world says, if I see him, then I'll believe. Well, that literally blows up in their face. They never woke up and smelled the coffee. Now they wake up too late and the Lord's cup is burning with wrath. And since Jesus comes in flaming fire taking vengeance and literally starts a lake of fire on earth, Second Thessalonians, 1 verse 8 talks about how in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. Since Jesus comes in flaming fire taking vengeance, literally starts a lake of fire, I imagine the enemies of God will have this etched in their memory for eternity since smell is connected to memory. Your smell is connected to your memory. And if you're in a lake of fire for all eternity and Jesus Christ came with a lake of fire, you're going to spend eternity thinking about that. So it gets all your sights. That's the senses at the second coming. You're going to see, you're going to hear sounds. You're going to see sights. You're going to smell. But then you got the soldiers at the second coming. That's laid out very well in Job chapter 2. And if you are the, uh, the average man, you like battles. You like warriors. You like men that stick up for something and fight. And that's what you've got in this story. You've got soldiers at the second coming. When we come back at the second coming, it will be the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, meeting the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. We've been fighting with spiritual weapons as spiritual warriors and spiritual battles, but then, at the second coming, we meet the kingdom of heaven. We will be fighting physically to bring in a physical kingdom. 
2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 described how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And in John 18, 36, the Lord, the Lord, how he was, he was talking about how his kingdom was not of this world. And John 18, 36, he said, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. But at the second coming, he's bringing in his kingdom and his servants are going to fight. The Lord and his soldiers will be the real visitors from outer space. The real avengers. So let's look at the soldiers at the second coming. Those that the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. We're coming back with the Lord on white horses. Notice in Joel 2 and verse 7. Look at Joel 2 and verse 7. It says, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Notice, the soldiers at the second coming, their stamina. With all nations gathered together, as it talks about in Revelation 19, 19, uh, they're all gathered together against us. We won't be phased because our glorified bodies will never run out of energy. We will be mighty men, much mightier than those of Genesis 6, 4. We shall run like mighty men. Right now, you see, your flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. And you have thorns in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Your bodily presence may be weak like Paul, 2 Corinthians 10, 10. But one day you're going to have a glorified body that won't need energy drinks or eight hours of sleep or an afternoon nap. We are waiting right now for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, Romans 8, 23. Because one day we're going to have Superman stamina. And even today, you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, Ephesians 6.10. He put the earnest of the Spirit in you as a foretaste of what you'll be on the at the rapture when you get the glorification. You get the new body. He put the earnest of the Spirit in you as a foretaste of what you're going to be on the outside at the glorification. You're going to have Superman stamina. You're going to have speed. Joel 2, 7, 9, 2, 7 through 9 says, We shall run like mighty men. You see, you got comic book characters like the Flash. He would be left in the dust as we run to and fro in the city, as Joel 2, 9 talks about. You see, the devil has walked to and fro in the earth, and it's time to cover up his hoof prints. It's time to take over. You see, you spend your life looking up to athletes whose bodies are, are just going to become worm food. Don't you know your vile body is going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Like the Lord's glorious body, Philippians 3.21. The Lord and his army will make the speed of light look like it got stuck in interstate traffic somewhere. Bodily exercise profiteth little because you're getting a new one that doesn't even need exercise. You can run all you want down here, but you'd be better off to exercise yourself rather unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and maybe it will get you a front horse seat at the second coming. So we're going to have the stamina. We're going to have the speed. We're going to have the strength. Joel 2, 2 through 3, and Joel 2, 2, it says, a great people and a strong we will be as a strong people set in battle array. Joel 2, 5. Superman can't hang. Imagine leaving heaven clothed in fine linen, which is the righteousness of saints, and the whole armor of God is on you naturally. Ephesians 6. No need for capes or spandex or even wings. With the strength to run up on the wall, as Joel 2 talks about, and climb up on the houses... Uh, Spider-Man just looks like a wannabe compared to that. No enemy shall escape 
from the Lord's army. You got tens, thou, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, as Enoch prophesied, as Jude lets us know about that in the book of Jude. The Lord's coming with ten thousands of his saints who are entering in at the windows like a thief, climbing upon the walls, running to and fro in the city like mighty men. Nobody's escaping. You may be weak and feeble while you're waiting on your new body right now, but you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. That's enough to take on the entire creation times infinity. And the joy of the Lord is your strength right now, Nehemiah 8.10. You've got strength in you. So we're going to have strength and sureness. Joel 2, 7 through 8. And Joel 2, 8 says, Neither shall one thrust another. No friendly fire. You're not going to shoot your fellow soldiers on accident. You'll have a sure aim. You're going to have sureness. You'll be, you'll be sure with your weapon. You won't trample your own fellow soldier. You're not going to stab him in the back. You're not going to kick him while he's down. Today, many Christians are going around shooting down their own brother, and we're living in a time of friendly fire Christianity. They see their brother on the ground, and they just rub his face in it. None of that is in the Lord's glorified army, though. We'll have sureness. We've got, we got the stamina, the speed, the strength, the sureness, and we're synchronized. Joel 2, 7 says they shall not break their ranks. Joel 2, 8 says they shall walk everyone in his path. We will know our place. We will know our role. We'll be perfectly in accord and in sync. Nobody jealous of where this person's standing, how close this person is to the Lord in the line of victory. It's going to be synchronized. Contrast this with today where the church gets full of divisions and strife and no one knows their role. That is the mark of the carnal and baby church, everyone trying to be the greatest. But soon all the church will know who has the preeminence because he will be the one in the front, and there won't be any diatrophies, as John talks about in 3 John 1, 9, trying to be the line leader, no diatrophies. You see, the Lord utters his voice before his army, Joel 2, 11, and the armies follow him upon white horses. That's us. Revelation 19, 14. Jesus is the line leader. He's got the preeminence. There's no need in us. There won't be anybody trying to get that preeminence from him. We're going to be in perfect sync. Know our roles. That's the soldiers at the second coming. So you've seen people's senses. You've seen the soldiers... Now, look at the Savior at the second coming. In Joel 2.11, you see his sword slays the wicked. It says, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. It says, for he is strong that executeth his word. The word is a sword. Hebrews 4.12. Revelation 19.15 talks about how he's got a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It's the same sword you possess as a Bible believer to fight the spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.17 Your sword is your defense and offense against the forces of darkness. Some people collect guns. Some people collect knives. I collect Bibles. Those are my swords. You put them in your living room, put them in your bedroom, put them in your bathroom. Put them in your kitchen, your car, and place the scriptures everywhere for somebody to read. Psalm 149, 6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Keep your weapon on you. And don't gird yourself with a new sword like that evil guy did in 2 Samuel 21, 16. It's much harder to draw blood with one of those new swords See Jeremiah 48.10. The Savior at the second coming, he's got a sword that slays the wicked. 
Joel 2 9, he shows up like a thief. That's the next thing. He shows up like a thief. Joel 2 9 says, They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. You see, the devil is presently the God of this world, and the Lord Jesus is coming to take over. 1 Thessalonians 5 2 describes how he comes as a thief in the night. Right now, we are defending ourselves from the, from the enemy who comes at us to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the one who wants to take your crown. But at the second coming, the tables turn and Jesus Christ comes to take over. He's coming to kill and destroy. He's coming as the thief in the night. Right now, the devil's coming at you as a thief. The tables are going to turn. He, the Lord shows up like a thief. And the next thing, he shares his victory. Joel 2.11 it says he shall utter his voice before his army. In a battle with of God versus the world, the Lord himself is the majority. The Lord doesn't need anybody or an army to wipe out the Antichrist and the nations. He's being gracious and sharing his victory with you. When I got saved, I got the promise of being victorious over death, hell, and the grave. 1 Corinthians 15.57 and I want my wife and kids to be a part of every good thing that happens to me. I wanted them to be a part of my victories. The Lord wants his bride and his children to take part in his victory over the sinful world and the Antichrist. He's going to bind the strong man, the devil, and let his kids get a good lick on him. Romans 16.20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. He's going to let you get a good lick on him. So he shares his victory. He could, he could just come down by himself and wipe everybody out. But he allows you to come back with him just so you can share in the victory. So that's the Savior at the second coming. His sword slays the wicked. He shows up like a thief. He shares his victory. And then you see Satan's army at the second coming. Look at how they're going to turn out. Joel 2 5 says, We come. Like a noise of a flame of fire that burneth the stubble. So that's the first thing. Satan's army, Satan's army at the second coming, they're stubble. They stand as much of a chance as wheat in a tornado. And there is a whirlwind associated with the second coming. Just imagine every disaster movie rolled into one. These guys are going to be stubble. They're going to be shaken. Joel 2 1 says, The inhabitants of the land tremble and the earth quakes before the Lord's army. Joel 2 10 says, The earth shall quake before them and the heavens shall tremble. The Lord Jesus is the one who bullies the bully. He strikes fear in those we've been afraid of. When the monster goes to bed at night, he checks under his bed for the Almighty. He is the one whom you should fear. Don't just don't be fearing them which can kill the body. But after that, have nothing they can do, but rather fear him who's able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. You'll see the devil's crowd sheltered in the dens and rocks of the mountains. They're shaken. Revelation six fifteen talks about how the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freedman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from him which sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath is coming, who should be able to stand? They want to be hidden from his face. We spend a lot of time being afraid of men. The Lord tells Jeremiah to be not afraid of their faces, Jeremiah 1.8. Why should we be afraid of them? We have the one in us whose face they're going to hide from. So Satan's army, they're going to be stubble. They're going to be shaken. And then think about the skies at the second coming. Imagine the skies at the second coming. Joel 2.10. See, the skies at the second coming, you're going to see signs. Signs are for Israel. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews require a sign. The church doesn't require signs. However, Christians today are looking for signs in the skies in an attempt to prove that the Lord is about to come back. But these signs in the skies are for the tribulation and the second coming. 
And this sense Christians are discerning the face of the sky and not actually discerning the signs of the times as they suppose they are. The signs of the last days of the church are marked by wicked behavior, such as men being lovers of their own selves and covetous, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. It's not about signs in the skies. And instead of looking at the sun, the S-U-N, they should give preeminence to the sun, the S-O-N, Colossians 1.18. Instead of thinking about blood moons, they should focus on building up the church, which is pictured by the moon. They should set their affection on things above, but farther up than the stars that are going to eventually withdraw their shining. That's what's going to be in the skies at the second coming. You're going to see the signs that are for Israel in the skies. The sun and moon darkened and stars withdrawing their shining. Joel 2.10. Joel 2.10 says, The sun and moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Finally, this will cause sinful man to look up. They can discern the face of the sky, but not the signs of the times. Matthew 16.3. Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Imagine eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and then you look up and you see something strange going on in the skies. Christians today are looking for signs in the skies in an attempt to prove that the Lord's coming back. But right now, you need to be just focused on what's way above that. You got the Son of Man in the clouds. That's what's going to be there. Joel 2.2 2 describes it as the day of clouds and of thick darkness. This is the moment the Lord and His saints have been waiting for. This is the greatest moment in history, and you can be a part of it. Jude 14 talks about how the Lord is going to come with ten thousands of His saints. This is the greatest thing you can be a part of. Your whole life you've been felt left out, you've been picked last, you rode the bench, you've been overlooked, felt abandoned, betrayed, but not with the Lord. You too can be one of the super soldiers riding behind him, and he's not going to forget to pick you up at the rapture either. He's not going to forget to take you with him at the second coming. It's going to be the Son of Man in the clouds. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They're going to look on him whom they have pierced. Joel 2 gave you details of the most terrifying and greatest event in history. And if you're on the Lord's side, it is a, it is a greatly sought-after event. If you're on Satan's side, then it should be a dread. Maybe you're on the devil's team, and would like to switch sides and be on the winning side. Come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner that you are. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his bloody death, burial, and resurrection. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, even from this wrath that's to come.